I had lost my voice um, in 98. I had vocal polyps and I lost my voice for two and a half years. And for someone who had always considered herself first and foremost a writer, I was shocked to discover how devastated I was to lose my singing voice. And my self-esteem kind of fell apart and I realized my singing voice was central to who I thought I was as well. But the good part of that, I did get my voice back, but the good part is that I developed this little cottage industry of writing essays. And I wrote for Rolling Stone and the New York Times and New York Magazine, the Oxford American, one of the great southern magazines in, in existence, and even Martha Stewart Living. And um, I wrote this piece called The Ties That Bind about family and music. And it ended up being chosen uh, for this compilation called Best Music Writing 2000. My editor at Viking called me up and he said, that's the beginning of a memoir. That essay is the beginning of a memoir. And I said, I'm too young to write a memoir. And he said, think about several volumes. <laughs> and then he gave me the work of MFK Fisher, who became, quickly became one of my favorite writers in the world. And she had this very peripheral way of writing a memoir. She wrote about her life by writing about food. And I thought, I could write about my life by writing about songs. And that was the overarching guiding principle when I was writing this book, is where did the music take me? Who did I meet because of it? What songs did I write because of what happened? Could I talk about the experience and the song? Could I talk about the true love and the song, the journey and the song? And I did. The songs became a great framework for this. And I think the best way to illustrate that is to read the intro to the book. For my entire life, I have been trying to give voice to the rhythms and words that underscore, propel, and inform me. Because my peripheral vision is more acute than my direct powers of observation, and my love of an A minor chord is more charged and refined than my understanding of my own psyche, I have often attempted to explain my experiences to myself through songs. By writing them, singing them, listening to them, deconstructing them, and letting them fill me like food and water. I have charted my life through not only the songs I've composed, but the songs I've discovered, the songs that have been given to me, the songs that are a part of my legacy and ancestry. Through them, I've often found meaning and relief, while at other times, I failed to recognize or understand a rhythm or a theme until it became urgent or ingrained, and I finally came across a song that captured the experience. My life has been circumscribed by music. I have learned more from songs than I ever did from any teacher in school. They are interwoven and have flowed through the most important relationships in my life with my parents, my husband, and my children. Songs have unfolded in my living room and under the spotlight. For me, music has always involved journeys, both literal and metaphoric. Sometimes I took the journey first and found the song waiting at the destination. Some songs have led me to true love. Occasionally, a song has been only a faint whisper at the periphery of a larger event, though it was always present. Many of my own songs have taken the long way around as I circled the edges of an experience, examining the placement of the furniture or the color of the room, the backbeat and the verses, the chord progression and the melody, constantly roaming and constantly curious. I dream of songs. I dream they fall down through the centuries from my distant ancestors and come to me. I dream of lullabies and sea shanties and keening cries and rhythms and stories and backbeats. I dream of the summer of love and the British invasion and the cries of Appalachia and the sound and soul of the Mississippi Delta. I have resisted so many times correcting public misperceptions about me in my life out of pride, 
out of pain, or out of a longing for privacy. But I relish the opportunity to write about my life in this book, not to set any records straight, but to extend the poetry and to find the more subtle melodies and themes in a life that on reflection seems much longer than the years I have lived. Documenting one's life in the midst of living it is a strange pursuit. I've always wanted to live as a beginner and writing a memoir in some ways defies that notion, but I consider this book as a first installment in an ongoing story. I don't know why some memories have persisted while others have faded, but I trust tenacity. So those are the memories I have written about. This is not a chronological fact check of my life, and I'm sure my sisters or my husband or my children remember some of these events very differently. I have abandoned my reliance on the external facts to support an individual truth, and everyone is entitled to his or her own. This is mine. So far, so good. More to come. More is always to come. I had to grow into being a performer, and it was years before I developed an ambition for what I was already doing. Um, and I had a lot of great voices around me to compare myself to unfavorably for a long time. And this little bit of the book is about one of those voices that was around me. One day in 1988, I was lying on my couch in a sleepy reverie as the afternoon sun spilled through the huge bay window in the living room of my log house outside Nashville when it occurred to me in a sharp, unsettling way that I was a singer. Not only was I a singer, but I sang for a living, which meant that a lot of people who were strangers to me were familiar with my voice without knowing me personally. They might not even know my name, but they had heard and could now recognize the voice, a product of my genes and experience, authentic but extremely personal in my estimation. This was largely how I felt about my voice, that it was undependable, beyond my control, somewhat embarrassing at times, if not too low, then too high, if not too soft, then too loud, or too harsh, or too wimpy. It was simply not enough, not right, and as such, it exposed me far, far more than I could comfortably allow. It presented the perfect conundrum, and therefore, an irresistible career choice. My ambivalent relationship with my voice certainly had something to do with the fact that thanks to my father's profession, our family was exposed to great singers, great singers who were also extraordinary personalities from an early age. My mother, for her part, was a devoted Patsy Cline fan and would say her name with slightly pursed lips, Patsy. 